Okay, and that is a wrap for at least the A side. I just wanted to get that in the can. That's that's fair. Yeah, I just want to read this tweet that Steve uh, shared, uh, and that there was no way to predict Trump would act like this in office except for everything he'd ever done his entire life. <laughs> yeah, no way, no way. <laughs> oh, golly. Okay, so... The world is messy. I don't know that there's anything else that I want to say about it. Yeah, the end of Ringling Brothers, but I don't think that's really noteworthy. Some people really want them to go away. Some people think it's the end of their... I think it's both. It's more for me, it's the, it's the end of a of an institution that's just kind of an American icon. Like, oh, I was actually able to see it at one point, so it's like, mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of sad. A friend of mine uh, was one of their showrunners. Because they had two teams, a blue and a, and a red, that were going around the country simultaneously. So there was two Ringling Brothers circuses that were traveling. And she was on the red crew. Mm. And they wrapped up, yeah, just shortly. And she actually, uh, she live-streamed the, the last show. Yeah, a friend of mine, I don't know if it was for Ringling Brothers, but it was some group. She was actually an elephant tamer. The the circus as it was in the heyday of Barnum and Bailey, like I'm sure the people from the past would be just absolutely thrilled to see it still going today, uh, but I feel like what really ha- really took them down was the change to how we prefer to have our entertainment. Like once upon a time, that's they came to town. And that was like the biggest thing to ever happen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it now was an it's event. Like, we're we're un- inundated with events. We have so many events; it's unbelievable. Like I pretty much have yeah. something going on almost every weekend. Mm-hmm. And you're in Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always a lot to do. In fact, uh, tomorrow I'm going to a concert down in West Palm Beach. Nice. I'm apparently going to be queuing. For a long time. Queuing? Oh. Queuing. Uh, my girlfriend would like to be uh, in front, if at all possible. Oh. So we're going to get there as early as we feasibly can, and then we're going to sit and wait. For what show? Uh, Muse. Mm. Nice. She's a major fan. Big fan girl. <laughs> major fan? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So I support her uh, her passions. So very cool. We'll enjoy that. Um, oh, I think I'm done. I mean, that's fair. I think I'm done. Um, well, just going through, even trying to prepare, it's just it beats on you. There's it's too like, much oh crap. God. Like you said, that so much is flash in the pan. It's like. Rage than done, but replaced by the stuff. But just... Yeah, and I, and you got to think about it all. You know, to yeah. to process it, to to take out just the noise. It's like, well, could that have any effect? Is that well, maybe if mm-hmm. in the right circumstances? And then I go all tinfoil hat and say, well, yeah, of course it could do this, this, and this, and this. But uh, will side it? Note, a side note for you, Andy. A yeah. book for you to look up is what I put in the uh, I pick. Oh, the American fascists, the Christian right and the war on America. It's from 08, but it still has a lot of a lot of connections. Today. You can see a mm. lot about essentially how Trump got in power uh, by what he puts out. <laughs> and he puts out. Yeah, there's a lot. There is a lot a link to the hat. The, OK. I've been wrapping my brain around what's going on, and it's like, how how could we invest people enough that they wouldn't willingly allow this to happen again? Did you listen to last week's show? No. Listen to last week's show. I don't usually tell you know, panelists to go back to our own back catalog and listen, but you need to listen to the interview with club. Yeah. If I, if yeah. I don't appear very, I, uh, very important stuff. Yeah. 
If I found it on a show, well, sure. I to do that, but no, it was good. It was... Yeah, no, uh, as far as reaching out to people, yeah. Um, I'll definitely be rewatching that and I'll take notes. Well, it's not just uh, reaching out to people, it's also reaching out to politicians and getting them to sign on to it and holding them accountable and actually providing a carrot and a stick. Right. Yeah. But one one of the major problems that can't be resolved at least not simply with the truth is the apathy that I don't you know there's a whole bunch of people that just do not care because they do not see the ways in which decisions that are made at the government level affect them. And you can't make them see that. They refuse to see it. Um, well, then as soon as you encounter those people and you realize that you can't go any further, move on to somebody else. And then it's like fishing. Oh, no. You this know? is a, a different kind of mind experiment where I design a new uh, government structure. <laughs> <laughs> for for what comes next? How if we how had we, a type one or type two technocracy, it'd be easy to be done. But that's also more government in direct hands of the people. Mm-hmm. They don't want that. It'd be. <sighs> I was trying to think of ways to change the dynamic between uh, what the government means to people and how they interact with it. Um, that requires people. Honestly, the way you reform that is not a quick fix. It is education because there were a lot of things I didn't give a damn about and didn't understand until I went down and got my degree in political science. And I suddenly went, oh, that's the way that works. And that's why it works that way. While it's confusing looking at it from the outside, from the inside, you're like, oh, now I understand why it works that way. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't really explain this to people because there's it's so much really difficult to get you to understand it. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. so much to unpack. That's the nature so of life. So how do you life. simplify this thing? You, mm-hmm. or, or how do you change yeah. the, the, the civilian and government relationship in a meaningful way um, to where they, they are inspired to care, even if they don't fully understand it? You have people who you have representatives and such that are more responsive to their constituents and senators who are. You've got them more wanting to go. Hey, contact us. Find out. Tell us what you want, so we know. Um, again, just looking at it from the past, it's times where where people have cared and given a damn have tend to be after essentially great tribulations and great calamity yeah. where people go, oh crap, you know, come save us. And they're like, okay, yeah, we can do this. You know, but then of course, after a while, everything's fine. Everything kind of, kind of normalizes. Everything's great or not great, but it's functional. And then people go, well, you know, what's the government ever done for me? Right. Because they're no longer living in the, in the shadow of. Trump. So you have, you have to provide a selfish interest. Yeah, they ha- the politics has to be self-absorbing. I have a proposal. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm game. What do you got? Um, the the most selfish and uh, circular necessity is people's pay. If everyone technically worked for the government, your pay was determined by whatever job you were in, still fine, and private corporations could negotiate, well, there's this many people in that job, it should be paid this, blah, 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 those pay rates can fluctuate. Um, But essentially, uh, your government representative ends up in part being responsible for how much money you make and regulating the economy as a whole through that avenue. Um, I think everyone would care about how much money they're getting paid. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know that that's that is a big motivator. 
because I'm scared the, by that concept. <laughs> the other the other concept that I had was that part of your uh, tax deductions are reliant on you uh, actually voting. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just I we need to have mandatory voting, but the thing is, the parties want as few people to vote as possible, which is rather telling. Well, well, no, well, no, that's different. That's not entirely true. As we've seen, the Democrats in those part want as many people voting as possible, because yeah. everything they've shown always shows the more people who vote, the more likely a Democrat is to win. Yes, the Republicans want as few people to vote as possible. Yes, this is that where was I where I was directly called them out. That was where I was going with that. I didn't think it needed to be said. <laughs> it does. I guess it needs it to be repeated constantly. Yeah, I guess so. just in case. I just, I just want to make sure people are informed. Yeah. Just making sure. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. I need a drink because this is it's all very yeah. depressing. Yeah, uh, where my idea fell down was trying to figure out a, a reasonable method of, of checking and balancing the needs of society to be paid with the needs to also have stability in that whole system. Well, you have to have the universal basic income at that point. Um, yeah, that does well, help. Them. It's, because the technology that's, is going to mandate that shortly. No, it won't. I can hope, but... It won't. At no point will we ever be forced to have it until population reaches a level where... Well, basically, one... Okay. I take it back. Because as soon as we have practical fusion and we no longer need coal for energy purposes, we no longer need gasoline for transportation purposes. You know, as soon as those industries are completely subverted into just very clean, very easily accessible energy and it's all on the grid and we're good. You know, basically what, what Musk is doing with uh, solar as well. You know, as yeah. those technologies collide, then that's going to change the infrastructure. Once the infrastructure changes, people's lives change. Right. That's also going to that collide will not, with that will not robotics make, and AI. It will not. Because that's another issue entirely. We're getting closer, but every time we think we're getting closer, it's another 20 years. AI is hard. AI is hard. AI, AI is super hard. But there, there's, there's a ton of repetitive type jobs that can be done by machines and done well. Um, and there are... But a know, lot of them are you don't, already you don't being done. anymore because you can do everything with a credit card and a tablet. As far as ordering, that's creeping you, into McDonald's and Panera's and not all over the place. Okay, hang on. Uh, there's I was in a McDonald's. Still gonna, okay. Huh? I'm tra- I travel all the time. So I was in a McDonald's that had seven of those automatic registers. Mm-hmm. It also had three registers at the front with people. Yes. There was one person working those registers. There were 25 goddamn people in the back of that restaurant filling orders. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you re- remove a cashier, you still got to flip more burgers. Because yeah. you increase you volume. You'll be able to do that shortly. You increase the volume. They there are machines that do flip burgers. Yeah. We've seen that. However, people do it faster. People Currently. do it people do it better. Right. Currently. But I also don't see that really going away. I do. It depends on a lot of things. If you just want to eat at Taco Bell and you just want to eat at McDonald's and you just want to get a pizza from a vending machine, then sure, all that's going to happen. But if you would also like somebody to actually grill your steak properly or to not screw up your fish that you're getting from a restaurant. You have to have somebody there because a lot of that is art. Computers don't do art. Not well. 
It might look like art, but it isn't art. <laughs> you know, it just isn't. But the 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 machine that can flip burgers and build a sandwich, grab a piece yes. of lettuce, put a tomato on it, put a piece of cheese, yeah. wrap it up, serve it to order. That same machine can operate uh, machinery that makes circuit boards. That same machine has no, the... That yes, same, it can. No, each one is a boutique item. Each one is custom made and custom programmed to do that thing. That doesn't mean that we can't have a that billion freaking machines. The current state of robotics, the numerous machines are going to have a lot more dexterity, a lot more mobility. But it will still be a custom machine for that task. At that point it's You're software. not you're not going to take a burger flipping robot and tell it to assemble a car. Because it can't do that. Right, it's not it designed to do that. And scrape solder paste and pick up a circuit board off a conveyor belt. However, there's still going to be a human QC at the end. We had robotic machines that are already doing the QC. There's still a human there that still does the final check. Currently operating the machine, yes. In that factory, but that's only one. But you're there's a lot of industries. The overall workforce. Right. As, as in required. On it's, it's going to take some time for the machines per, to catch up. But the thing with machines is you train them on one line and then you can copy that software to countless machines. To do the exact same job. Right. But each job and then, and then is you different. you tackle the next job and the next job. The thing the is that the machines, what I'm getting at is the machines are not as flexible as people. People are easily retrained for another job. Some more than others, but sure. people can be retrained and we have all the tools to, to do these things. You know, we have, we have the big brain pan that we can do these things. Yes. Computers have to be very meticulously reprogrammed to do that every time. There is no fuzzy logic that lets them do that now where they can just sure. train themselves. Again, there. there. We're many, many, many years away from that. Now, I may... I may be completely wrong. It may be here tomorrow. But I sure as fuck doubt it. I because I work be in the industry. Next ten years. Hmm? I think it'll be in the next 10 years. I don't know. I don't know. It, and, and it depends. Like every it depends on many application, things. We're going to roll out code that nobody fully understands. <laughs> and a whole bunch of machines uh, that, you know, they've got the robotic arms in existence that mimic... And have the full range of motion and the similar strength rating as an actual human arm. Um, yeah, that's something that exists. Uh, maybe not as speedy, but it's out there. Speed will come in time. Well, in some cases, much faster. But again, there's there's trade offs. There's trade offs and everything. Right. So it may not be. But so it, it may the, be speedy, the, but the it may also be aspects of doing delayed. it are are fading out quickly. Uh, the what is left is the the brains and the software behind those brains to actually do the things. You know what concerns me? Hmm. Concerns me the most of all. I love having my Echo system. I love having my Google Home device. I love mm -hmm. being able to talk to my house and tell it to do things. But I'm not talking to my house. I'm talking to a server in a very far off land. Mm -hmm. The very second that you have any interruption in service, these fail to work. Mm -hmm. There's no local mode. So, as we become more reliant on cloud-based services, the less that we're, we, we are not robust. It's, that's a natural ebb and flow, though. Right, but how long because, is this ebb and flow going to be? Because it's right. also, right now, it's, the, it's so cost-effective to have that level of machine learning and intelligence and feedback all centralized into a big repository that's answering all the questions and just feeding back to whatever account happened to make the request. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very effective for that. But, you know, right. I would like my own private Jarvis, thank you. 
I don't want so, to have the to. The hardware still has to catch up a bit. For that. But not much. Not much. And I'm waiting for them to release it into the into the wild for offline use. Like, if that was Echoes, because, uh, because there's another version called um, the Echo Tap, mm-hmm. and it's a battery-powered Bluetooth speaker that happens to have those features enabled. But you'd have to tap it to actually make it do things. It's not always listening. And it's something that's completely portable. You'd bring it with you. It would, like, tether to your phone then. But if it had enough smarts in there to do all the things, to listen to my voice, to do that recognition, and then do whatever silly command I'm asking it to do, then cool. We're great. Cortana's the same deal. Cortana is still talking to, talking to a main server. Yeah. Yeah, but the what, the what he's doing there and setting up is getting closer to what you're talking about because he's made a custom version of it. Actually has a hologram. Yeah, the oh, that's just more processing the, uh, power, though. That's not less. <laughs> yeah, well, no, so the idea of it being more, it's closer tied into the home. But than that it is well, but it isn't. <laughs> it's using API calls that are just calling the server to do other things. You know, it it has a custom overlay and different application calls, but it's still using the main Cortana interface, and that's all. Yeah, that's all in the cloud. I. I don't want a cloud. I mean, it's great to have a cloud. It works. It works wonderfully when it works. But right, being a traveler, I hit areas that I don't have the, that connection. I still have to have things downloaded to my phone for when I'm not in a coverage area. We do not have ubiquitous everything connection all over the place. Not yet. No, not yet. And there's crazy people like Elon Musk that wants to launch over 5,000 satellites, mini-sats, into low-Earth orbit to provide a global internet coverage for everyone yeah. on the cheap. And he, he will do it or somebody else will do it. Somebody's going to do he it. He has approval to do it. It's going to happen in the next couple of years. But the, I don't know what's going to access that network because that's not going to be a GSM network. That's something different. Yeah, it'll be something else. Yeah. Um, they've tried uh, lower Earth orbit satellite-based phones a couple different times. Hasn't worked out yet because the signal on the satellites wasn't strong enough. So hopefully oh, well, they will have learned from past history. And there's plenty of satellite it. phones. And yeah. the the internet that's out on, yeah, out on cruise ships. Phones, oh, yeah. Plenty of them. Like, there was Iridium. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's one well, of the big back. companies. Yeah, and they're still doing it. That was a big one, and they they were going to do satellite phones for literally everybody, and that was part of their business model. Was it was is available everywhere. It's satellite, you can use it anywhere, and what they unfortunately discovered was you can use it anywhere as long as it's not under a roof. Yeah, it has to as has soon to have as line you of sight. Under a roof, you were done with your signal. So that's that's where they kind of uh, yeah failed. It's because a bit of a drawback. They, in order to have access for everybody, it has to work inside your homes. Yeah. My phone doesn't even work in my own home. Mine does. Google Fi, baby. Yeah, I've got Google Fi. It doesn't work in my house. Because it's the Sprint network and the T-Mobile network. And both yeah, of those... Uh, your Wi-Fi. Yeah, and it does not hand over properly. And the calls suck. Really? Mine yes. are fine. Nope. They suck. And I've had two phones now. Both times, huh. they suck. They don't hand over properly. The The call quality sucks. Weird. Yep. It, it's not transitioning right even to my headset versus the phone. You know, that I, a call that goes across my Wi-Fi, which it should just go over my Wi-Fi at all times. You have more audio problems than anyone I know. I do. I well, yeah, and uh, yet I'm a podcaster. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, it's like this is this is the problem of my life that I get to face. Uh, it's it's very strange. I don't understand why. But you'd think that the phone. Hey, look, I'm in Wi-Fi. Let me just use that. And I've got yeah, and I've got wonderful, nice, fat pipes here. 
two of them now. I thought maybe it was just Spectrum, a.k.a. Bright House, a.k.a. Charter, or whatever now. But no. <laughs> I, then I've got AT&T. There's nothing but the phone on the line, and it still won't do it. It still wants to use the cellular to make a phone call. That's super weird. That's the way it is. Now, my yeah, Republic... That's not how mine works at all. Now, my Republic wireless phone... It uses the Wi-Fi first. It prioritizes Wi-Fi. Yeah. And works. So something with Google Fi, the algorithm's wrong. It doesn't want to do it. It does not hand over properly. It doesn't want to prioritize that. And when it does finally connect on that, it the call quality sucks. And yet... That's super strange, because that's not the experience I have at all. And yet, I can use Hangouts on the phone, and it's beautiful. I can use Hangouts yeah. on the computer, and it's beautiful. And I don't have any problems. It You'd think it's the same protocol, but it's not. It's something else. So I am bleeding here on the edge. <laughs> Left bleeding on the edge. That's weird. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass is what it is. I'm, yeah. I'm actually going to have to get a landline for the things that I do at home. And yet I have all this internet around me. And I should be able to make a goddamn VoIP call. And no, it's not working. Yeah. Why yeah. don't you just use, have you tried Google Voice? Google Voice is in my phone. Right. You can still make calls from your Gmail using that phone. It goes across number. Hangouts. They're, they're disabling all the old Google Voice stuff. Right. But I mean, it's still your phone number that your phone's associated with. Yeah. Because I've, I've called in using that. Yeah, it's going away in like a few days. Yeah. They're, they're folding that program into just Google Fi. Mm. And the, there was um, the, the chat features that were in Gmail. All yeah. that little chat that was on the side, that's going yeah. away. That is being rolled into Hangouts. I'm shocked that it took this long, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, considering no, it should all be the same thing. That's what I use to make my. Uh, well, I call it Google Voice, but it's Google Fi because mm -hmm. it's my phone number, my yeah. cellular phone number that I'm calling in for my conference calls and things. Yeah, I use I use Hangouts for that hmm. because that comes across as being my my phone number, and Hangouts just as a messenger. If I get a text message and I'm not using Signal at the time for my text messages, it'll come across the, the Google Hangouts and I can answer it from my, from my desk. So things like that are working great. I'm not having any problem with that. I'm having problems with the goddamn phone itself. That's really weird. Which phone do you have? The Nexus 6P. The sec <laughs> you know, I'm on my second one, so it's not the phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just... That's really strange, because I'm on the 5X, which is the lesser model. <laughs> Maybe I should be on that one. Not I don't know. Problem. I wonder if there's some sort of weird port filtering going on down there. That wouldn't surprise me, but why is everything else working? Different and, ports. And I have... I bought my own cable modem. <laughs> so there's nothing closed on that. Yeah, and I have that DMZ'd over to my Ubiquity network and I've got all the ports open that I could possibly think of directed to the phone there's nothing blocking it unless it's completely outside the house and I'm working on two different networks doing the same thing so I tried it on AT&T still that's super strange yeah so it's the phone. And yet every now and then when I'm out and about, I'll get a call and it's coming across a free public Wi-Fi that I'm on, which is pathetic in, in strength, but it's coming across on that. And it's like, why am I even getting that? And I miss a lot of calls because it just didn't find a network. Mm. Just, no. And then I just get a voicemail. And then I get the text of the voicemail, and that's what I like better, because I didn't really want to talk to those people anyway. 
<sighs> and this is technology. So do I really think that the robot overlords are going to take take control anytime soon? Boy, I hope they have a few more bug fixes first. Because if my current technological situation is any indication whatsoever, and I'm close to the edge here, I've got a lot of going, going on with me, it ain't ready for prime time. <laughs> No. I can just kick the robot overlord, you know, gently, and it'll fall over and fry. So I'll say, hey, come well, back when you're better. Well, the, you know, I'm having a completely different experience with my technology over here, so I don't know. <laughs> some that's why I'm more apt to believe it. So some results may vary, but I'm telling you, it is not ready for prime time. Or I will be some techno mage that will then be, you know, fighting against the future. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe that's or fighting it. for the future. Well, you know, we we are all the heroes of our own tale. We write our own. <laughs> we write our own story. And history yeah, is written. The antagonist of everybody else's tale. History is written by the victor, after all. So all you have to do is survive. <laughs> survive long enough, and you can tell any kind of story that you want about yourself. So. I mean, just look at that 70-year-old Cheeto. Exactly. He's definitely writing his own history. In frightening Living ways. in his own world. Yeah. But, you know, I've got enough processing power in this house to do something. Set something on fire. Oh, easily. <laughs> easily. I have things just in front of me that aren't even computers that I could set things on fire with. I mean, <laughs> they're electronic, but I wouldn't call them computers. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I could set a lot of things on fire. That's not even a problem. That's easy. But it's it's the, why doesn't this computer talk to that computer, and why don't all the computers that I own that are logged in with my accounts work together? Why not? Because that's not the business model. The business model is one computer per person. So there's no point in having them work together. Mm -hmm. But what about in a larger infrastructure? Imagine your 10,000-seat enterprise. Okay? The the mythological thing that, well, several of us actually work in. But imagine that that 10,000-seat enterprise. And imagine each one of those computers that's running all the time so that it gets updates and everything and, you know, You don't turn them off. You're not supposed to turn them off. Imagine if all of those just happened to be networked together and worked together to solve a problem. One computer somewhere is running a a crazy algorithm and has to do it, so it distributes it across the network. Across all those computers. Automatically. Automatically. Gives 1% of its CPU cycle. 10,000 computers give 1%. That'll happen in time. Eventually, but it might yeah. also require us to get something along the lines of dot hack or, you know, several animes I've seen where you essentially have a single unified computer system. Nobody uses Apple or Windows or everything else. It is just, this is it. And no one else uses anything besides that. It became the monopoly. Well, such a system wouldn't become the monopoly, but it would really beat the shit out of the competitors. But I'm saying, but in those series, in those things, that was the whole thing of the one, essentially one operating system just took over everything. Nobody else uses anything else because there's no point. And all the, all the other ones basically died out and went bankrupt. Windows nearly did that. But now it they looks had, like <clears throat> Linux and its free kernel is going to, it's really going to take uh, over. There's going to be, there's still jockeying for position. Windows Phone had the most potential of anything. No, it did what? Who the hell are you? No. No, Windows had, Phone didn't have any potential. It had potential. It had no it market poorly share. poorly executed. It had no market share and never was. It was poorly executed. I had a Windows Phone. It was nice. but Yes, it was a nice phone. It wasn't right for the time. you get a single fucking app for it that you wanted. Not entirely yeah. true. You I, I actually I had everything that I needed. I had everything that I needed on it. But still... It wasn't the it wasn't the one. So if they had gone with the model that they eventually went with for Windows Phone, 
which was you can now access the Apple store and the Google Play store and it'll run all the apps. Um, if they had done that from the get go, instead of trying to compete with two stores that had over 16 million apps on them. Okay. The thing that, the thing that you just said does not exist. The wind, the, the windows mobile platform, as you stated, will not run iOS apps. It will not run Android they apps. Put into it. No, not like that. No, you will never get something that that came from the Apple App Store to run on anything other than an Apple product. What they've done is there is a it's called Continuum, and it's Microsoft Continuum, and it is part of the the feature that will allow a 32-bit application to be ported directly into the Windows Store. Because what they're doing now is they released Windows 10 S, which is store only. The S stands for all sorts of things, all of which they're not going to tell you are the right thing. But really, it's just look at it as, that's Windows Store Edition. Nothing that comes from anywhere except the store will run on that OS. So you're never going to have Google Chrome. Apple is actually putting iTunes on it. So you'll be able to download iTunes through the Microsoft Store. I had read at one point that they were going to do an emulator. Not for iOS apps. Ever. Yeah, it was going to be iOS and Android apps. Nope. Now, what they... It's not an emulator, but there is a trans a translator that would allow uh, Android apps to become Windows Store apps easier. But still, it's not your plucking it from the the Google App Store or the iOS App Store. None of that, no. The developer has to make it happen and drop it into the store. It's a developer tool that has nothing to do with consumers. This I know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, that's, that's the way of it, because... Microsoft wants people in the ecosystem. They see very clearly what it has done for Apple, and it's keeping Apple afloat in a post-PC consumer culture. Right. So that's the thing to do. Okay, we'll provide the Windows 10 OS. We'll but it's lock like, it down. It's like trying to launch Mace, MySpace in the era of Facebook. Not exactly. The, because the what it does share has already been eaten up. It's not about market share. It's it's about keeping market share. And if they can grow it, they will. And what they're doing they, is they're they're making the the Windows Store edition very appetizing to education. It's the education sector stuff. Because Google and the Chrome OS are right now dominating in the education sector. Far and above even what Apple's doing. Because iPads are too freaking expensive. Yep. And they can't be managed as easily, amazingly enough. Weird. So, and so you have, have Android cell phones, so you can use on that too. Well, no. Because remember, we're, we're talking about students and a, a school board that does not want interoperability between the two things. They want complete control over the platform. So the thing that an, that a Chromebook can do is a hard wipe immediately, and it reboots. And it's back to exactly where it was, and you sign in, and it forgets the previous user in seconds. Not minutes, because right now that same thing in Windows takes five minutes, and that's on a fast machine. Mm-hmm. So right now, they're dominating. They're absolutely dominating it. The hardware is cheaper. It's easier to maintain, and the user experience is better. It wins. So, Windows, Microsoft, is competing not with Apple as much as it is competing now with Google. Mm. They're competing with everybody, but that's the deal. So... Because of the way Chrome operates, they can't, put, can't allow Chrome to go through con- the continuum process and end up 
as a Windows Store app because then it breaks certain things that Chrome is built on. The sandboxing, uh, certain other things, it just goes away. Edge is the only browser that works with the Windows Store Edition stuff, the Windows 10 S. And that's because it's built from the ground up to work as streamlined as possible, to use as little processor as possible. It conserves battery. It shuts down all sorts of other things. So doing the same thing with, with the Edge browser, you'll get 10 hours of battery life. If you do it with Chrome or Firefox, you get four because of the amount of GPU and everything that these browsers are natively trying to bring to bear. They're trying to be a full operating system in that window. And it shows in how hungry they are for memory and how hungry they are for all the other resources. You know, I'm sure that you've turned on a browser on a laptop and suddenly heard the fan kick on. You know, that's not a, that's not a unique experience. You know that that machine is now working infinitely harder just because you opened a browser. Yeah. You know, just doing this, I can see all of my processors are cranked to the max, not just because of video, but because I'm also getting a Chrome window open and trying to do things there and just browsing and just having it render nicely on my screen is taking up a lot of system resources. So Microsoft took that into, into account when building the Edge browser. They didn't allow hardly anything to ever go in it. It's very limited APIs. So it, the architecture is different for that. And though you could bring Chrome over, and they might, they might do it, it would not function the same. And it would not give you the battery life that you'd want. You'd still probably want to use Edge. Also, you wouldn't probably be able to make it the default browser, because why would Microsoft let you do that? Hmm. You know, they want the best consumer experience possible. And if they can control that, then they will, and they'll say that, no, it has to be Edge. And since it's being locked down to only the store, then they're not going to charge you as much for it either. But only store apps will run. So you could do the Photoshop online because that would run in a browser. You can do anything that runs in a browser. That's fine. And most things do run in browsers now. And like Skype will run because that's available in the Windows Store. Nearly everything that we're doing now would be able to be run on that system. Not my XSplit broadcaster, unless they brought it into the Windows Store, but that's on developers to do. But that would be the only development platform. Now, it'd be cool, though, because just like, David, you've, your experience with um, Microsoft Office 365, you know, that kind of solution is the same for then all the apps on, on the store all the programs you just sign in and say I want that installed I want that installed I want that installed and then you sign into the next computer with it and your apps are there and they can actually follow you so mm -hmm. there's some pluses here there's some big pluses to it but is that what you want you know it, it still removes a lot of flexibility but boy would it be great for parents and when I say parents, I mean our parents, giving it to grandparents. Say, here, here mm -hmm. here's your new machine. You know, all the functionality of Windows, and also everything is sandboxed, and you can't download anything bad, ever, because it's locked into the, into the Windows Store. Nothing new can be installed unless it comes from there with the right security keys. So it locks out all that nasty stuff. Only zero-day exploits that would be able to affect the, the operating system directly, which affect us all anyway. So it's got some real, some real benefits. But also, people like us are going to say, <laughs> I like to game. <laughs> I like to do all these other things. I'm not going to rely on that. Yeah. But, you know, imagine Steam. Yeah. The Steam store puts its application into the Windows Store. So then you, then you run the Windows Store app, you get Steam installed, and then you install all your games through Steam. Anyway. So there's workarounds. And that would probably be something they'd do. And they'd probably, 
they might only allow things that are like plates with Windows certified or whatever to happen that way. But yeah, it's it's a different a different ecosystem, and they were never really going to let Android apps in. Uh, things like that were only going to be the like the strictly Windows Mobile for like screen sizes of like seven inch and smaller, or whatever. So, but that was just a way to get people to have the ability to only have to code it once, and then you could bring it in. So if you already had your Android app, or if you already had your iOS app, they built that connector to bridge the gap and bring it over so that it could be run on a Microsoft phone. And right now, that program's dead. They just zeroed out the inventory and the entire line of business. So no profit, it's dead. That doesn't mean that they're going to change their, change their mind and start it up again. They certainly could. Because... We also never thought that Microsoft was going to build computers. But they're making some really interesting computers. Mm -hmm. You know, the Surface and the Studio. The Studio is really compelling, but it's too weak. It was like a a last generation, like two generations ago, i5 was the best you could do in that thing. And with a spinning disk. It's like, come on. Come on. You guys can do better than that. But it was all about the big display. It was basically a super display with, yeah, okay hardware to drive it. Yeah, we've got two of them. They're pretty neat, but a little sluggish. So, but that was also a a highlight reel. Like, hey, look what our system can do. So then people like Dell and HP, they build one, and it's better. So they're, they're doing it to showcase the product. It's like here, you know, same with the, uh, like the Nexus line was, here's how you do an Android phone. Well, here's how you do a real, you know, Microsoft certified product. This is what we want to see out of the world. Mm-hmm. I still want the courier. You know, two flat screens as a book, open it up, have two, two side screens, and then, okay, now I, now I got a keyboard. Yeah which was way ahead of its time. That was before even the, uh, the iPad came out, that yeah. Microsoft had come up with that. Yeah, but back to where my original thing was, mm-hmm. if they had done an emulator and allowed you to access or gotten you somehow to be able to access Android and iPhone apps on the Windows phone, they'd have just crushed market share. Yeah, but that Rather was... Rather than eking out a small portion of it. But it, it but it wouldn't it wouldn't be allowed to happen. You can force developers to start making things for the Windows Store. Well, they they bribed people to make things for the Windows Store. They were paying them to make things for the Windows. They were store. paying them, but nothing's the same. It's not the same as just instantly having access to all all of the apps that you already want and use. Yeah, but it was never going to happen that way. Have you listened to some of the app developers and what it takes to make these things? It's hard. Well, sure. And just supporting one platform is difficult. And then when you then shoehorn that, what you've already done, onto a different platform entirely. Oh my God, the bugs. I would not want to have to chase those bugs. So really, it just, it was never, you're always going to get better if you write native for the platform. Always. Yes. My point is they tried to force everyone into native and then tried to take a whole bunch of market share that they couldn't get. Because, Mm -hmm. yeah, you've got 10,000 apps in your app store. You're only missing 15,900,090 or 990,000 apps. That everybody else already has access to. Yeah, but how many fart apps do you need? And there are a lot of fart apps. There's a lot of those little lighter apps, you know, showing the flame. It's the principle, it's the advertising aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, you can get a Windows phone, and you can have anything as long as it's limited to this number of apps, which is a mere fraction of what you have access to with any other phone. Yeah, but the argument goes, but those are the apps you want. As long as those are there, it doesn't matter. It's easy to convince people otherwise. Yeah. 
but it's also easier to convince them that, hey, just go with that Samsung that everyone else is using. And go right. with that iPhone that everyone else is using. Because the, the grand market share is iPhones and Samsungs. It's not Android so much as it is Samsung. I don't have a Samsung. I've never owned a Samsung. I had one at one point. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And you can very easily tell that by, oh, man, I need a new case for my phone. Oh, jeez, is it not a Samsung? Is it not an iPhone? Then I'm going to have to, I'm relegated to the back channels to find somebody that somehow made, made one because they thought it would be profitable. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, the Samsung specifically has gotten a lot of interconnectivity between all of their products. You've got like, yeah, you can sure. have like the Samsung tablet and the phone and the TV, and they can all just go, oh, we, we're friends, we're cousins, click, click, done. Yeah, they yep. got a lot, of, a lot of that interoperability. It's ecosystem lock-in. Because that was the other problem. Had the Windows phone been another year earlier, that's probably all it would have taken to really capture some market share. Because that was at, at the same time that Blackberries were really just falling away. So the other thing that killed it, that was really bad with the Windows Phone, was that it didn't work with fucking Exchange out of the box. <laughs> it wasn't ready. It was not ready. Yeah. Had had it been ready for business and not just consumer and been another year earlier. Then the Windows 8 phone was really nice. Mm -hmm. But it was too late to the party. Yeah. Far too late to the party. Yeah. Because, again, it's all about ecosystem lock-in. I have bought a lot of apps on the Google Store. Right. I would have to buy all those new apps on whatever platform I would move to. Yeah. So I'm going to stay with Android. That's where that's where the emulation of the apps But would it wouldn't work because you'd paid. still have to buy it through the app store for the phone platform. Because the emulation isn't for the consumer. It's for the developer to simply move it over to the app store. That's all it is. It would not work like an emulator that you get for, you know, a Game Boy or something like that, where you just download the ROM and you're good to go. Wouldn't work like that. It was never designed to work like there's, that. There's there's ways to make it work like that. It wouldn't work like that. There's ways to make it work like that. If you're a you developer, I think that'll download the APKs from the App Store and install them. But it wouldn't run the APK natively. Right. That's and also. That would be cheating. That would be illegal. If they allowed that to happen, all they have is just a giant lawsuit on their hands. Yeah. Apple's settled plenty of lawsuits. Microsoft's a big fish. They could handle a lawsuit or two. And it would kill the platform, though. (laughs) Platform's basically dead now. What difference would it have made? We're, we're talking about it having a chance, a fighting chance, and that what you're what you're saying is it would what, create a legal the way debacle. They rolled it out never had a fighting chance. No, it was bad. It was bad. Yeah. The only way for them to have had a fighting chance is to have pulled an apple and just bulldozed their way through, fought it out in court, settled for a lot of money, but came out with some market share that they can then continue on with their Windows Store. The press would be terrible on that, though. It would absolutely be terrible. Because it would be... That's been Apple's MO from practically the beginning of the iPhone, where they had to settle out of court with Cisco for the name iPhone. I mean, yeah. they don't give a fuck about that. They can make but, that go away. But that's a name, and making it so that you can pirate software. That's different. It's software that uh, rightfully belongs to the user who's utilizing it on that phone. No, that's not how end-user license agreements work, and you know it. We don't own any of the software we use. We lease it. All property so rights Apple's- All property rights revert to the maker. All of them. Hmm. We don't own a damn thing in this culture anymore. 
I mean, for all intents and purposes, at any point in time, for all intents and purposes, we do own it because they can't take it away from us. (laughs) But there have been cases where they do. There have been cases where people logged in and they tweeted something negative about the company and the owner of the company disabled their account. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For bad press. Too much negativity in the room. Bye. We reserve the right to review the service to assholes like you. <laughs> that kind of thing. So... And with uh, with the way the FCC is going, it's not going to get any better because it's not a pro-consumer culture. So, now, all we have is what we have. We got Android. We got iPhones. There's a few others out there, but they're fairly worthless. Yep. If you want to have a phone, you've got those two platforms. That's pretty much it. Even Nokia is making phones with Android now. Even yep. BlackBerry is making a phone that is run by Android, even though it does have a slide-out keyboard, and it's really cool. I saw one in hmm. the wild. Of course, it was owned by a Canadian, so that makes sense. But it was, pretty, it was pretty slick. It was a big phone, lots of glass, lots of real estate, and then slink keyboard. <laughs> in addition to all that real estate, and it's like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Felt good. Kind of wrap around screen. This is very nice. Very nice phone. Hmm. So. Well, they have a history of making things that are pretty, but don't function super long in my experience. I had a BlackBerry Pearl that I hurled at a wall, a cinder block wall, and it kept working. <laughs> I went through four Blackberries at DRS because oh. their little slidey pad kept failing. Slidey pad? What model yeah, so, did you have? So it was, I think it was the uh, follow up to the Pearl, which had the little ball. Yeah, the Pearl had the ball, yeah. It was, there was the um, so curve. The, the curve would had get that too. sand in it, and that would stop functioning. Oh, yeah, fine. So they came up with this other one. It was a button that had a capacitive wear on it. So you slid your thumb over it in whatever direction, and that's how you operated the screen. So it was like the trackball, but it Mm. was just a flat little panel with a button behind it. And that, I went through four of those phones. (laughs) (laughs) Because that thing would stop functioning properly. Yeah, I I just cleaned out the little trackball. Yeah. It was That was not an option, because it was a capacitive layer. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, there's, there's nothing for me to clean. What fuck doesn't it work yeah we, we had moved on to iphones and androids by by the time that had come around yeah. so fun times well that's tech talk with andy and dave and, and steven so <laughs> oh Wait. things i know <laughs> technology i know <laughs> uh, sometimes better than politics but it is now the next day so i think we should probably wrap it that's fair. Yep. And we'll lock this away in a uh, in a time capsule for the uh, for the the Patreon backers of the show. So, so thank you all for for being here and participating in the show, and also thank you Patreon backers for well backing us. It is Ooh. it is appreciated greatly. And if you're catching this some other time, well, uh, shoot us a message or something. Let us know how things are going. And with that, I think we're gone. So, killing the outputs. We're done on Twitch. Oh, come on, really? There we go. Hopefully you all survive the Trump Trump apocalypse. <laughs> yes, maybe if, maybe this is like the time capsule and all <laughs> no one else will hear anything about us. We will live on in the memories of whoever's uh, whoever's watching this. And they're saying, "What was a Blackberry?" What was an ah, iPhone? Well, we, we've taken some of those because they're pretty sturdy, and we sharpened the end of it, and we put it on a stick, and now it's, now it's our spear. No, that's what you did with the Nokias. The 5180s? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, see, those well, we you tried, all glued together, we tried that with the Nokias. 
we tried that with the Nokias, and they're simply too robust a device to be sharpened down. It takes too long, it's too much effort. <laughs> <laughs> they're only good for hammers. Blunt force yeah, trauma. Like I said, those ones <laughs> you take, you put them in, you put them in the ammunition for a trebuchet, and you fire them at the enemy castle. And you can recover it later and reuse it. That's right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, my, my 5180 story is it fell out of uh, my jacket pocket in the snow in Virginia. It was outside for five days in the snow as the snow melted because it was warming up. We ordered a pizza. Pizza guy showed up at the front door and said, hey, I found this phone in the snow. And not only was it still on, but everything worked. It was still on, too, five days later? Still well, I, wow. I have had a good habit of keeping my phone fully charged. So, you know what? Yeah. You know what? You probably kept it alive just by having it on in the snow, because yeah. that was just enough battery draw to keep all the inner electronics functioning and not freeze. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That, that's probably what happened. Yeah. It was on life support the whole time. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, he handed it to me, and I made a call, and it, everything was fine. That's crazy. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Just absurd. It's good fun. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. These aren't making me more. They ran out of the unobtainium required to make the shells. Yeah, must have been. <laughs> no, they melted them all down to make Wolverine. Nice. <laughs> Adamantium phones. <laughs> 